Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, wherever you may be. It's time to try and go and learn some BioWorks with Mr. Henley. We're going to start Unit 2 Study Guide here today, and uh, we're just going to jump right into it because I know you don't have time. Remember, this is on YouTube, so you can pause it, you can fast forward it, rewind it, make me talk fa twice as fast, make me talk half as fast, and uh, do whatever makes you happy. Uh, you don't even have to watch it. You can just scroll along through, hit mute, and don't even listen to me. Uh, so exposure control plans are going to be C. Uh, that's required when working with potentially infectious materials. The universal precaution... Oh, and by the way, um, I'm going to try to be a little extra here and actually give you the page numbers of where you can go in the book. So if you got the new book, this should be the page number. Now, if there's a new edition after I've recorded this, they may not line up exactly right. But right now you can find this information on page 10. Go look at that, read over it. It's a good thing to study. Uh, universal precaution um, is going to be A. That's going to be assume that all blood is considered potentially infectious. It doesn't matter if the person's sick or not, you're, you're infectious. And then you can find that on page 19. Lab standard has to deal with E, covers working with chemicals on a laboratory scale. And then general duty clause, you're going to find that as D, covers all workplace safety requirements. And uh, I guess that leaves us with C-A-E-D-B. B would be job hazard analysis used to identify ways to minimize the risks to safe levels. Um, and there's all our stuff there. Next up is a little section about the three A's of safety. Awareness requires you using your five senses. Think, look, listen, feel, and smell. Um, they seem to have left out one. Look, listen, feel, smell. And taste. They left out taste, but uh, you don't really want to use that at a job, do you? Uh, it comes from the knowledge that process technicians have about their jobs. Um, attitude is another one of the three A's of safety, demonstrated by the process technician's sense of responsibilities, and uh, makes safety a personal value. And then finally, we have process technicians must prevent incidents uh, by following safe procedures and be involved, and that's action. And that's probably best done by say, see it, say it, solve it. And you'll find this towards the end of the unit as memory serves. Uh, so what's a HASCOM? Well, HASCOM is short for hazard communication. It's the employee's right to know what chemicals you are being exposed to, the risks associated with those exposures, and ways to minimize or eliminate. A lot of this has to do with allergies and things like that, or if something you're being exposed to can cause a long-term effect. Globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals. Uh, that is going to be a growing international system for standardizing chemical classification and labeling. Lockout tagout is a very intense process. You could take entire classes on this, but it's the procedures that use devices or the lack of power to physically prevent machinery from turning on and using signage to warn workers, hey, don't activate this machinery. Somebody's working on it at the time. Flashpoint is the lowest temperature at which something will actually ignite, meaning it'll catch fire in the air. Bloodborne pathogen standards is basically when we come into contact with human blood or other potentially hazardous materials, um, then we know that we um, what how to work with that. Um, even high school teachers or elementary school teachers, you know, educators in general get bloodborne pathogen standards. Um, safety switch is this kind of your mindset. You know intrinsically um, how to identify and react to risky situations. Um, you just kind of know. Breakthrough time is when a harmful chemical liquid touches the outside of a glove and how long until it gets into the interior surface to contact the skin. Latex gloves, vinyl gloves, nitrile gloves, even a cloth glove is going to have a breakthrough time, at which point that, you know, if it's maybe an hour, then after an hour, you change gloves. You put on a new set. It really depends on what you're working with. So uh, next we get into the short answer section where they're going to ask us some questions and we need to answer them. And they ask, what is OSHA and what is its purpose? It's the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. It's a organization within the government. Um, the government formed it to try to reduce workplace injuries, illness, and death. 
What is an SDS? Explain what can be found in the document. This is a safety data sheet. It used to be called an MSDS, Material Safety Data Sheet, but now it's just SDS. It's the primary source of information about chemical hazards in the workplace. It tells you about these chemicals. It tells you, hey, you got exposed. What do I do now? It tells you how to clean them up, if there's a spill, and it gives you some basic information and in identifying them and things to be aware of with them. Explain the hierarchy of control. Well, essentially, the hierarchy of control is these three things. Engineering controls, administrative controls, and the PPE. Uh, PPE is personal protective equipment, and it's actually the least effective method, which seems kind of weird because you hear people push about PPE all the time. Are you wearing safety shoes? Are you wearing safety goggles? Are you wearing the appropriate head things, you know, maybe to keep hair out of stuff or beard or anything like that? It could be gloves, all those different things. It's actually the least effective by that point. Um, engineering controls are much more effective. This is the stuff you're going to see with like there's moving machinery gears where we have a cover so that you don't even get close to getting entangled in that. What is the responsibility of the company and what is the responsibility of the employee as it relates to workplace safety? Well, workplace safety, ultimately, um, the, you know, the company has to follow OSHA. The company has to pro try to pro provide you with a workplace that's free from potential injuries and things like that as much as they can reasonably of course it's up to you basically and I kind of joke about this but a lot of the responsibility of things is you it's always your fault you're responsible if you want to be um, kept a job at this place then you have to adhere to these safety and health regulations. You are responsible for your safety, your co-worker's safety, the safety of the customers that you're feeding the product to, the, cust the safety of the community and the environment, the safety of any visitors to the plant. Basically, who's at fault? It's going to be you. Uh, explain the NFPA and how is it used? Well, NFPA is the National Fire Protection Association, but it's this diamond, and you probably have seen this outside of like stores. Like if you go to a home improvement store or a chemical manufacturer, you'll see this big diamond, red for fire, uh, blue for health yellow for reactivity, and then white is just kind of special, like we've got some other stuff that we need to account for as well. Primarily, respondent fire departments are going to use this to kind of give them an at a glance, what do they need to be aware of as if this building were to catch on fire, what can they do to try to protect the people inside. Explain the steps to proper lifting, including what is the power zone. So never lift more than 50 pounds alone. Um, I mean, I know 50 is kind of a lot, but 50 is typically believed to be okay for one person to lift. Lift with the leg muscles, not the back. The power zone is that area that's closest to the body. This is where the arms and the back can lift the most amount of weight with the least amount of effort. And generally, if you're going to store stuff that's later going to need to be picked up, try to store it at the power zone. You know, don't try to store it down low where you've got to lift it to the power zone. If you can unload it and pick it back up there, then you're within that area where you're going to have the least amount of effort and the least chance for personal injury. What are ergonomics? It's kind of weird to say that, but ergonomics is a science and explains some risk factors. So work-related musculoskeletal disorders can be prevented through this applied science. Risk factors can include repetition. So you think about like assembly line where you're doing the same motion over and over again. You know, you hear carpal tunnel a lot for people with their, mic with their computer mouse. Uh, the force of an incident, the duration, and the posture. All of these things are things that go in there. So all these things are things that you need to be aware of inside of your workplace. Now we get to my last two favorite sections, fill in the blank, because fill in the blank is pretty straightforward. Blank blank is a PPE item that requires additional training prior to use. Well, this would be any kind of respiratory protection. If you're dealing with anything that requires, like a, especially a forced breathing thing, then you're going to need to be trained to use it. Some chemicals can be dangerous dependent on their amount or concentration and their storage location. Amount, concentration, and storage location. And I had a slightly different, I'll be honest, I had a slightly different uh, set of answers. I had location, amount, and concentration and use. Uh, I thought they had the and in the wrong spot. So, um, well, a little bit different here. 
Let's look at the next one. Comprehensive approach to protect workers from hazardous chemicals at the work site is known as chemical hygiene. And every workplace should have a chemical hygiene plan. Even schools, as a high school chemistry teacher, we have a chemical hygiene plan or you know, a semblance of one at least. Uh, if the flash point is less than 100 degrees Celsius, then the substance is considered flammable. Blank blank can indicate that vials were overfilled during processing, so this would be low yield. And honestly, I think this is a leftover question from Unit 1. Um, I think this was on the Unit 1 study guide. i got to fill in whoever wrote this. Uh, no offense, because I do this all the time too. Copied and pasted, and somehow this question just got reused. Whoops. Uh, 26, chemicals, biological materials, electricity, and slippery floors are all examples of hazards. They're all examples of things that could potentially cause an accident at work. And um, that's near the beginning of the unit on page four. And now my favorite section. And yes, I know it's kind of geeky, but I, I enjoy doing this because I feel like it really stretches your mind to see if you fully get the information. True, false. And if it's false, we're going to correct it to make it true. Uh, true, false. Uh, 75 pounds is the maximum weight one should attempt to lift alone. Well, we just talked about this, didn't we? we that, so that would be false. Uh, the best answer for this would actually be 50. A technician should never enter a permit required confined space without specific training. Sounds reasonable. That's true. The back is the primary muscle used when executing proper lifting techniques. You actually do not want to use your back. You want to use your legs. You want to use your legs. The leg is the primary muscle you should have. And remember, uh, too, that when people put on that uh, brace, that's called the Superman effect. When they think, oh, I can do this, and no, no, you can't. You keep thinking you can do these things, Nemo, and you can't. Sorry, uh, Disney reference. Uh, uh, let's get towards the last couple of questions here. The walking and working surface standard was developed as a result of slips, trips, and falls. Uh, yes, that is true. A workplace emergency is any incident that occurs when something risky occurs, but there's little to no negative outcome. Um, that is false, and it looks like they're focusing on the word workplace emergency. So it might be worth it to go look this up later, what is a workplace emergency, but that is what they call often a near miss, but they say it's better to think of it as a near hit. So it's a near hit is what we're looking at here. Little to no negative outcome occurs, and so we, we, you want to be careful. You, you know, don't just be like, ah, I'm lucky. No, you, you want to be careful. Final question, um, a configurational hazard is when an operator is required to get into awkward positions to run and maintain equipment. Uh, that would be true. That would be true, indeed. So anyway, we are done. So now, hopefully, you can use that information, back it up, fast forward it, pause it, do whatever it is that you need to do. I wish you the best on your test, and I'll see you in the next video or in the classroom. Have a great one.